Welcome everyone. I'm Sherry Elam and I am uh, thrilled to have my guest for this month is Nanette Davis. I've known Nanette for a lot of years and I can vouch for her uh, credibility in that she has earned her place in this interview. A lot of beekeeping behind you um, now that we've we're over a decade, and I know you're even longer than that. Welcome, Nanette. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, in regards to beekeeping, this is my 12th year of beekeeping, so slightly longer than you, um, but you've had a lot a lot of different experiences that I haven't had the ability to, to get into. But besides that, um, when, when I was younger, I... Um, got to experience a swarm that landed on my house and I had found a bee in my window and I, I thought, well, I have to save this bee. And I was about five years old and I took the bee from the window and I took it outside and let it go. But when I got back into my room, there was another bee in the window and another bee in the window. And I, I knew something was different. So I went to go find my mom and we went outside and we saw there was a swarm right outside on my side of the house. And we got to watch the magic of that moment as the swarm decided to relocate somewhere else. And it was, it was a memory that stayed with me forever. And um, it, it brought me back to bees in my adult life when I had the ability to choose and, and make my own uh, way in the things that I wanted to do. And since I like to garden a lot, I wanted bees. And I said, well, let's bring bees into this picture and make it a great picture altogether. And then I told my husband, I think, I think I want to get bees. And he said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I've heard oh, that. <laughs> oh, well, that, it just shot down my hopes and dreams. So I, I still thought about it and I looked at it and I looked at books and I looked at videos for about three more years. And then I told him, honey, I'm going to get bees. Um, I showed him the catalog. This is the beehive that I want and you can get it for me. Christmas is coming or <laughs> I can get it for myself. <laughs> so that's how we got into bees. So there's, there's always a start story and uh, yeah. I had no it, idea Scott wasn't on board when you started. It, he was not but he's he's <laughs> much better now. He is. I know he is your uh, partner in crime now. I've seen him many times at different events and um, that's a wonderful story. Um, it truly is. Um, anytime you can relate to your child pardon me, my ch your childhood, and then getting, being able to fulfill that. It's awesome. So we're embarking on May. And, you know, that's a busy time of year for, for us beekeepers. Um, and depending on where you are in that level, there's uh, commercial groups that are still, you know, they're pushing splits big time and so forth. And, and I think the smaller scale beekeepers, we're just trying to uh, time it just right to get supers on. What, is, what are you doing right now in your bee yard? So I, I work in two different ways. So I look at, I, I may want to make splits and find new homes for those splits because there's a limit to my ability to work with so many bees. And then I also want to make some honey. At some point, I want to help the bees make some honey. So I have hives that I dedicate. These are going to be my high population hives that I'm going to split. And these are gonna be my high population hives, hopefully, that are going to make honey. And it's really a delicate balance in trying to keep that so it, it doesn't spill over and I lose bees instead of gaining bees or my neighbor gains bees instead of me gaining bees. That, that is, um, <clears throat> you're right, it's a balancing act. Um, and having production hives and, and still um, keep, keep the right amount where, where you are. You're a backyard beekeeper, aren't you? you, you that's true. You subdivision. Yeah. You know, that's a real, um, I'd love your insight on that. And I'm sure that our listeners would too. How do you manage that with this time of year population growth? How, how are you managing that? Um, well, a a lot of planning and a bit of luck goes a long way. Um, one thing is I'm not quite in your city subdivision. I'm more of a outside of suburban, almost rural subdivision. So that gives me a little bit more leeway 
Um, there's not a homeowners association that's active in a way that would um, try to enforce certain boundaries. There is no rule. Our, our rules are so old in my subdivision. There's no rule against bees or for bees. Um, but it, it's still a responsibility of the beekeeper to be aware of your neighbor's needs and animals needs. So what I do is I try to manage the populations so that I'm not going to get swarms occurring. But I also make provisions if there are swarms, what what can I do to prevent my neighbors from having to experience that? And then last case scenario, if my neighbors experience that, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to be responsible in that case? So I set up um, bait hives to make sure if I wasn't able to manage the timing just right on the hives that they have somewhere to go that hopefully they enjoy. And if they don't choose those bait hives, well, then I've had to do a trap out once, once in 12 years on my neighbor's tree. And uh, she, was still, she was still happy and, and very pleased that the bees honored her with her presence, but she would oh. rather be honored from afar than up close. I tell, I tell a lot of students that uh, your neighbors didn't take the class that you did and uh, they didn't they didn't opt into wanting to be beekeepers so you have to respect that it sounds like you're doing a great job of that um and i know backyard beekeeping it's more of a challenge challenge to do that um so you um just to to brag on you for here just a second i you know we've known you for a lot of years but over the last several years um multiple years probably now you are the uh, international ambassador for Flow Hive. And that's a pretty neat, is that the right distinction? Or I did I... Ambassador is yes, um, international is no, okay. because well, I'm just... not, <laughs> well, technically I went to Canada with them, but I'm, <laughs> I'm the ambassador in Texas. Well, husband. we'll take that. Hey, internet. Texas is a, a, a continent all of itself, right? It's a full <laughs> nation in itself, right? Exactly, a full nation in itself. Regardless, you are um, you're very knowledgeable with Flow Hive, and I'm not to get off into that because we'll end up with more questions than answers. In comparison with Langstrup, which is what the majority of us use, um, how do your honey yields in your Flow Hives? Because I know just a portion of your bees are in flow hives and the probably, I don't know what the percentages are in Langstrom. How did the, the honey yield go? Um, are you, is it about even or how does that balance out? More or less what? So whenever I talk about flow hives, the first thing I always tell anyone is that a flow hive is a Langstrom hive. You manage it exactly the same way. You have to do all the same beekeeping responsibilities, the only difference is when you put on that honey super and you make your harvest. So comparing the, the hives between just the traditional style supers and the flow supers, there is no noticeable advantage for using one over the other. Um, at times, bees don't like plastic. And so at times they may be reluctant to get up into that plastic but there's ways to work with that. Just like when you're working with plastic foundation, you put a little right. coat of wax on that and it encourages them. You mm -hmm. can put your honey super on a little early, put it at the bottom instead of the top and they have to mm -hmm. climb through that plastic. They become very accustomed to that particular smell. They're spreading their smell in it and it encourages them when it's time, then you put it where you want it and they're, they're already used to that piece of equipment. Oh, wait, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Um, but I'm glad you said what you said, because so often, especially our new students in, in our classes, is that, you know, they've either purchased or what the flow have, and, and they have the idea that they don't have to manage bees. It's just, you know, it's just, it's a box that you don't have to do anything with. So I'm glad you pointed that out. We still have to be beekeepers um, regardless. So when will you put on those honey supers? Are you, uh, we are um, April 12th today. Uh, that you and I are talking, which is a couple of weeks before this will publish, but um, when will you be putting on your supers? Very soon, very, very soon. Um, I don't have them on yet, but what I'm looking at is what's blooming. 
what are, what are the bees doing? What's blooming right now? Yopon's blooming, but that might not be enough for me to get an mm -hmm. actual uh, honey crop from, mm -hmm. but I'm counting on the tallow and I'm looking at the trees right now and I don't see any tassels whatsoever where this time last year, I already had tassels on the trees. So each ah. year, each season is gonna be different. So I have to let nature guide my course there. Um, yeah. So I'm looking for those tallow tassels and when I see them developing, then I'm going to pop those on. Of course, I'm also going to look in the box to see how much is filling up with, with nectar from other mm -hmm. sources. So mm -hmm. once, once I have my two deeps, I do two deeps and then I do a honey super. Mm -hmm. Once I have those two deeps filled out, I'm going to put it on regardless of whether I have a bloom going um, or not because I know it's coming and I don't want to miss it. Well, and, and the Yopon blooms, and I must tell everyone, you're Southeast Texas. Uh, you're not a long way from me. Um, our interview last month was North Texas, but a uh, rule of thumb, and I didn't make this up, so if it's wrong, then I'm not going to take credit for it being wrong, but every hundred miles is about uh, between a week to 10 days difference in season. So the further north you go, so if we're seeing Yopon blooms now, which we are as well, matter of fact, there, some of them are kind of going down, then that 100 miles, they're going to be seeing um, that progress in their area. I saw um, this morning uh, one of our uh, fellow beekeepers that you and I both know saying that um, mesquite is starting to, I think they call it tassel. But regardless, you're right, watching, watching what's going on in your hive inside is a key to knowing when to add those supers. Um, so I, one question that we get a lot is backyard beekeepers, how much am I gonna expect to get from my hive as opposed to a rural or a farm setting? How, what is your average on your honey production per hive? Every location and every hive is different. Um, for my location now, I've been here for enough years to kind of get an idea of what average really would be. And mm -hmm. that would only be about three and a half to four gallons for me per hive. If it's a strong enough hive to really bring in a surplus. Some of them are not strong enough and I'm not going to get anything. Well, that's not bad though, when you, when you think about it. I mean, that's, uh, and I'm sure your neighbors are reaping the benefits of that as well. So even if they don't know it, <laughs> even if they don't know it, that's that's really not that bad. I, I'd say that's on the upwards end of good um, for backyard beekeepers. So um, when you, uh, so you pull your honey supers about when we do, I'm guessing around 4th of July is our magic um, number. Are you, are you prepping to treat for Varroa or are you test? I know you test um, just because I know you, but uh, what's your plan of attack? Do you have something different going this year or, or is it, you know, do you have something you'd like to share with our, our listeners that uh, how you address the Varroa once honey supers are pulled? So I, I don't have, I'm, I'm variable in that I'll do what, what I feel I can accomplish in that season. So um, I'm gonna change up my treatment sometimes. I like to do oxalic acid, but sometimes I feel like I don't have enough time to do that. So I'll, I'll switch up and that's according to um, research, good to switch up, even though there's no evidence of resistance that I'm aware of to the oxalic acid. But um, I, I've tried a couple of the other treatments um, and apivar seems to be one of the ones that time-wise, it, I can pop it in and go. If I don't have time and I know I have to do it, I can count on that. If I have more time to say, hey, let's be super organic and wonderful this year, that I can use some of the other treatments. But the more hives you have, the less time you have to, to give to each one. So that's something to keep in mind, especially with a backyard beekeeper who to, has a typical kind of suburban lifestyle going mm -hmm. on nine to five. So you're a weekend beekeeper in most cases. That's so true. And um, you're right. And we're kind of on that same same path that organic if we can. And then um, then April bar is a very good product, that very good product. It gets it done. It definitely gets it done. Well, what is because um, um, I know you're on limited time today and I don't want to take any more than what we have to. 
Um, two quick questions. Do you use a queen excluder or do you not? Um, I'm variable on everything. I, <laughs> yeah, I, you are. You're easy, huh? <laughs> yes. So, so in in the beginning, I'm like, yeah, let me set this hive up and I'll put that queen excluder on. And um, <clears throat> in the end, I'm like, oh my goodness, I just need to get the boxes on and get out there. And time is really a huge factor in in managing everything. So, some yes and some no. <laughs> I go either way. The bees, don't, <laughs> the bees don't seem to have a problem with, with me being variable. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Well, that question's in this month's uh, coming month's issue, or the previous month, the one coming out right now, the one you're in. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's wonderful to know that we can be fluid, right? That, that sometimes it works for some hives and some hives it doesn't. Um, it's been a joy talking with you, Nanette. You're, you're brilliant. And I, I assure everyone that's listening now that we could talk to Nanette for uh, a long time and get some really good, a lot more information from, from her. But Nanette, just give us a send off. What uh, last thing, if somebody walked up to you today and said, uh, what do I need to do to get ready for May? Um, what would Nanette Davis say to them? Um, if they were in my area, I would say manage your population know what's going on in your hive. You have to have your equipment ready to, to address whatever is going to happen in the next two months. So if nothing else, be prepared by knowing this is the progression of bees in this season, and I need this kind of equipment to address those needs. Very good advice. Truly, truly very good advice, and I, I concur with that. Um, thanks, Nanette, um, and, uh, and we really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you on the road at uh, the TBA Summer Clinic coming up in Conroe. I'm pretty sure you'll be there. So uh, thanks for your time and Texas Bee Supply and the readers, we really appreciate you. Thank you. We'll see you again soon.